to begin with, I would hope that some of you might have a particular prayer concern that you wanted entrust into our keeping. I've been asked to focus upon Margie Licht. She did take a turn for the worst, and people are in a waiting and watching mode for her, so please pray for her and her family. Are there others? Laura Brown. Flora Brown from the Emmaus community. Other prayer concerns? Then I have some things that I've been asked to highlight for you that are printed for you. Moving forward, discussion with Pastor Garretts, Saturday, April 28th, 9 to 11, Fellowship Hall. We will meet to discuss our partnership of shared ministry what we have learned, and how to proceed. Any question that you bring to that occasion will be useful to us. Reverend Garretts has come to us in a variety of roles in the past. This time he comes as a specialist about interdenominational partnerships. So any concerns you have, any fears, or any good news that you want to share about your experience of what we're doing together with Emmanuel, that's the morning for you to come and discuss it. I'm going to ask Arlen in just one moment, but first I would like to tell you that on Tuesday, I would like to invite you to come to the DACU delegates meeting if you'd like to be part of it. It is meeting at Emmanuel, and there will be a history of Emmanuel shared but then they have asked me to talk about St. Matthew and Emmanuel in partnership. When some of you came to the St. Luke's Good Friday service and then were able to reflect back to Karen and I, your experience of our representing not only our own faith but the faith of the churches, when some of you attended that service and told us about it afterwards, it was very helpful to us. And there will be about 50 delegates that are invited to the meeting on Tuesday, 6.30, at Emanuel. If you're able and interested, please come. And you can represent the St. Matthew part of that conversation. You will see in the... Uh, bulletin inserts the day of serving event. Um, this is, uh, it's called the big day of serving. It's Saturday, May 5th. It is put on through group ministry with St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in Dubuque as the coordinating um, church for the Dubuque area and this particular event. We have our, some of our confirmation youth that are planning to attend that. The cost, the cost that's listed in the, the bulletin is $39 per youth. That is the regular cost. Uh, if we're able to, the early bird registration is $29 per youth. And so with that cost, it covers the supplies, the um, different activities. There's going to be a Bible study devotion time during their lunch break where they'll um, receive some information, receive some material to kind of focus on um, what's serving and, and how that applies into their life. Uh, they'll be doing various service projects around the Dubuque area, um, some within the downtown area, um, as well as other parts of Dubuque. And then there's a um, final get-together bash that they'll have uh, with a band and just kind of a nice wrap-up event. The, um, on the back table there, there is a nice donation bucket. Uh, we are looking if anybody is able to, to uh, donate, and that'll help offset some of the costs for the registration of the youth. Um, it's a great opportunity for these kids to not only serve within the Dubuque community, but they'll be working with other youth and adults from communities both near and some distant from the Dubuque area. And it'll be just a nice opportunity for faith and friends and fellowship and serving how we reach out to our neighbors here in Dubuque and serve our Lord in that way. So um, if you're able to um, donate any, you know, any sort of funds, that would be greatly appreciated. And afterwards, I will probably be informing of how the event went. I'm looking forward to it. 
And so I thank you for your support and prayers with that event. One more opportunity to serve, and it, I've been out of town, so I've just learned about that this week, too late to put it in the bulletin. We in the Downtown Dubuque Christian Outreach Churches have helped before with a project that St. Luke's Methodist Church gets funding for. It's wading pool gardens that are used primarily by families in the downtown area, but also by some preschools. Um, the five-foot plastic wading pool is filled with compost and perlite and uh, soil so that families can grow vegetables right in their backyards, even if they don't have space to dig up. Um, on Friday from 9 to 4 and on Saturday from 9 to 12, uh, they're going to be delivering the, all of the supplies to families and using shovels to mix the soil and getting the family started. I've mentioned this in the voice before, they're also needing garden guides to help families during the year. But if you, if anybody is free, there's a, a, a the information is posted on the mission bulletin board by the elevator. It's both Friday and then Saturday morning. They need, if you have an SUV or a truck, you'd be especially valuable, but if you're just willing to help cart bags of supplies, that would be important. Thank you. Any other announcements? Then please take a look before you leave today at the evaluation form for the Lenten Easter season. It begins with my name there to assure you that I really do want to know how your experience was. And then there's a reminder there that St. Matthew's Congregational Covenant requires that your insights and your observations be owned, so you need to sign that line. I really would like you to think back using this format about what worked well and what didn't work at all, how you were blessed, what you wanted to know more about, what we can do the same or differently for next Lent through Easter. Thank you so much for being a part of this year, and I look forward to your also being a part of next. Join me, please. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Most merciful God, With joy I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants your newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please stand and share in the entrance hymn number 370, Christ Jesus Lay in Death's Strong Bands. We'll be singing verses 1, 4, and 5. <laughs>
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Last Sunday, you might remember that people had a little bit of a brain freeze when I asked them about the previous Sunday, and finally we remembered it was Easter. And Jesus was resurrected on that day. And then we asked everybody the question, where did he go next? Some people thought maybe it was heaven, directly to heaven. Other people had other ideas. This week, the second week after Easter Sunday, we're still wondering, where did Jesus go after he rose up on Easter? That's what Arlen was giving you a glimpse of. Jesus came back so that people could touch him and see him and hear him. And the choir sang that beautiful poem that is put to a melody. But in case you didn't catch every word, or in case you had a little difficulty understanding the meaning of the words, Arlen was showing you what those words might mean in movement. When you prepared for that, was that a faith? exercise for you? Did you think about Jesus? What did you vis visualize? I guess I visualized just being able to express what the song was speaking and I find it to be a very enjoyable exercise for opening up the song and really embracing it. And as I was doing this, I was thinking about what he was doing, the actions, the wounds that were part of him, and how that has kind of breathed the spirit of life into his disciples, the Holy Spirit, and he will then so share that with others. And it's a unique gift that I can confident with myself as well as that. And this embrace the, the song of the movement, you know, with all that. Do you think that you could sometimes, maybe at home when your door is shut so nobody can tease you in the family, do you think that you might pray that way or read the Bible that way with some movement? Today we have another way to touch and even taste Jesus coming back. These itty bitty beautiful little communion wafers were sent by Alyssa Augustine from Germany for us. She is part of a group that does important things so that Jesus is real within the world. This group of deaconesses in Germany, they have a factory and in that factory they make pastor clothes and beautiful things, pyramids to put on the altar. And then, with a little waffle iron, they actually bake these communion wafers. There are several different beautiful designs on them. They have a shine to them that I think is really nice. And yesterday, just to make sure they were good, I ate a few. They taste better than the usual communion wafers. The important thing is, in buying these communion wafers, we are sending devoted people out into the world so that Jesus, the Christ, can be real. They have daycares, they have preschools, they have education all the way through college. They also have homes for disabled people. They have hospitals and nursing clinics. They are an active group in the name of Jesus. I would like to give each of you one of these special.
chapter 3. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him his perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Please join me in reading Psalm 4 responsively. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. The second lesson is from the first book of John, chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness, Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the reading. <coughs> Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins 
is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. By the time I started at Luther Seminary, the professor named Gerhard Frost was already in retirement. His books were there, and in one of the books, there was a beautiful poem about a pair of shoes. They were children's shoes. Professor Frost remembered those shoes because of the little girl that never wore them. His daughter died, and in his poem, he wonders, if parents who have not lost a child can truly understand what a great privilege it is to work to buy shoes for our children's feet. Today's gospel is not terribly different from last week's gospel. In the time with our children last week, I asked kids to remember the previous Sunday, and they expressed what many of you adults also admitted to me, Easter seemed like a long time ago. Even a mere week later, it had disappeared into memories. And memories are precious, especially of those who have died. But believers need to have the vitality of the real living faith. A faith so real you can touch it and hear it and see it. And in some realistic ways, understand what we mean by it. Last weekend, I talked to God's children of all ages. Where did Jesus go after the resurrection? And many good, earnest Christians confessed to me that they may have forgotten to remember that. This is the second Sunday for preaching. Last week, the main character was Doubting Thomas. This week, the main characters are us. I believe that you deserve to believe that Jesus' after-death appearances were really enjoyed by ordinary believers. The reason I began the sermon, talking about Gerhard Frost's poem about his little girl's empty shoes, is because I think this week we receive a challenge to be working to provide for others. And we do so after the example of God's child, God's son. And God is a parent who gets it. God's work came to us in the shoes, maybe the sandals of Jesus. God tells us in the gospel we are to be at work after Jesus' example. And God's grieving, loving heart does understand the enormity of both the price and the privilege of being at work to provide for others in the world. This is how a spiritual director describes that time when Jesus came back after Easter and appeared. In describing this appearance to his disciples, St. Luke emphasizes the reality of Christ's resurrected body. They were not seeing a ghost. It was not a hallucination. It was not mass indoctrination. It was far too shocking to be just wishful thinking. Jesus makes all of this abundantly clear by his gestures and his actions as the reality of his complete physical personal presence sinks in. The disciples are overcome with joy and amazement for the Lord has done some remarkable things and they're true. He has turned the worst defeat into victory. He has conquered injustice and violence and hatred and rejection and even death itself. He takes them all into the tomb with him and they dissolve as resurrection. The level of our spiritual joy and amazement when we think about these things need to be real for us. If you cheer with gusto when your favorite football team wins a championship, 
do you also cheer with gusto at the idea of the resurrection? In cheering, we make a pledge about our own resurrection. In your bulletin, next to sermon, I asked Kathy to print one single word. And I'm hoping that somebody speaks German and they can tell me how to pronounce it. H-O-S-T-I-E-N-B-E-R-E-I-T-U-N-G. How do we say it? Good girl. What does it mean? I pass on that. <laughs> At least you can pronounce it. <laughs> Kathy is a very capable typist. But I think it took her as long to type that one word correctly as it normally takes her to type a whole paragraph. <laughs> what do you think about Jesus coming as the host, the bread of faith, the blessed brokenness? That word came with the communion wafers as Alyssa Augustine talked about the real work of the deaconesses in Germany. I like that guy, Mort Krim. He's a radio broadcaster out of Indianapolis. I talked to him once before. I talked about him once before. Mort's broadcast is called Good News for a Change. And I want to talk today about some good news about what happened at Knoxville, Tennessee. There was a city employee and she was doing her job. But in response to business as usual, an entire crew at the post office responded. The crew was on their break, and they looked out through the windows, and they saw a man and woman leave their old truck parked by the sidewalk. They also left in that old truck 10 children who looked raggedy and obviously poor. The man and the woman went into the Salvation Army office next to the post office. They went right under the big cross that proclaims that the Salvation Army ministers in Christ's name. Along came a meter maid. She very efficiently ticketed the old truck with the 10 kids in the back. She put the ticket on the window and she went on with her daily route. Now what happened was the postal crew was so affected by watching that happen that they went out and they took the ticket off the windshield and they drafted an epistle to the local police chief. And they told the police chief that within all the rules and regulations, all the law and order of society, there has to be compassion. There has to be advocacy. And they told the police chief that if he really wanted to find that couple and their 10 kids, they would cover the fine themselves. But in the meantime, they wanted him to think about the way he administered his authority. St. Paul wrote an epistle not from a postal crew, but from a group of believers that were increasingly believing that God needed them to be advocates for and advocates against some basics within their society. Today's epistle lesson, that second reading, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. We have a parent God. We are the children of that God. We have a parent God who gets it. God has done the work in response to which we pledge ourselves to be at work. Have you read the Gospel according to Oprah? I doubt that Oprah is fluent in German. Maybe she can't relate to Hostien Berutung? Hostien Bereitung. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Oprah has never read 
fluently or spoken Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, or Latin, but I want to read to you something from the Gospel according to Oprah. During the years of her popular TV show, Oprah's episodes often had a Sunday morning service feel to them. Well-respected religious critics say Oprah may not be ordained, but she sure is pastoral. On Good Friday, one year, Oprah had a topic, and the topic was miracles. And she invited on incredible, inspirational, real-life stories about beating the odds, about sacred coincidence, about triumphing over defeat, and about survival that could not be accounted. Oprah says she has a mission. Her mission is to transform the whole community by promoting individual transformation. Like a religious leader, Oprah asks her guests in the world to testify about their experience. Why has the gospel according to Oprah reached all the way around the world, so many millions of people for so many years? This is what the writer says. Oprah is very human. Like Jesus, she was believable when people met her as he was believable when the world met him. Oprah wants to do something to relieve the reality of suffering. She watches, she listens, she acts. She understands that self-examination in prayer and in meditation is crucial if we are going to be healthy. She's easy to understand. She does not rely upon a level of expertise or experts that are so far above the understanding of the average person that it makes no sense to them at all. Oprah teaches generosity, and she's all about the need for forgiveness. In other words, she's a living reminder of that which is good. That which is truly important for humanity, God came into it as Jesus. This past week, the Mutual Ministry Committee made an attempt to go back to the beginning and understand how we could be at work for you. In the book, Pastor and People, Mel Kishnick, an associate in ministry and staff associate, with Wheat Ridge Ministries puts it this way. All calls to all ministries in the name of Christ are initiated in baptism. There's a call from God in which God takes God's call to all humanity. There's also a call from within your spirit. And finally, there is a call from among us to serve one another. The second Sunday after Easter, the emphasis is upon you. The phrase that it ends with is simply, you will be my witnesses. Amen. <laughs>
let us together declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was born by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Enlivened in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we pray for the life of the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation, responding, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy, recognizing, reconciling God, open our hearts and minds to receive you in the scriptures, and in holy meal, send us forth for the healing and redemption of the world. Hear us, O God. Renew areas of your creation where cold and dormancy is giving way to warmth and new life. Reveal your life-giving action throughout all of creation. Hear us, O oh God. Usher in peace where lawlessness and disorder reign. Send your calming spirit to ease tensions and to, cur to encourage ways of living beyond conflict and oppression. Hear us, O oh God. Answer the cries of those